All right, welcome everyone to today's Insights and In-Person Connections program, The Clothes We Live In with Mona Lucero. Let me... So to begin this program in the spirit of healing and education, History Colorado acknowledges the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archeological work, and create educational programs such as this one. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. So welcome again, everyone. My name is Tamar McKee, and in addition to being your moderator for this afternoon's program, I also manage the Stephen H. Hart Research Center at History Colorado, as well as the Insights and In-Person Connections lecture series putting on today's event. The Stephen H. Hart Research Center is the public access portal for researching History Colorado's collection. We dynamically assist researchers from all backgrounds with exploring our photography, archives, and artifacts for use of multitude of projects, genealogical research, historic property designation, school assignments, design inspiration, and writing books. Applicable to today's program, for many of the textile pieces you will see, you can actually make an appointment to come in and safely see them along with any other artifacts or archives associated with them. Or you can explore our ample online database and resources. I will share out all links to all of these resources again with you in a post event email. So stay tuned for that. So I also wanna just give a little shout out about that Insights and In-Person is actually a series. Today you are joining us for the Connection series. It is our lecture series. Uh, coming up this week, we have our How-To series, which is more kind of a practicum-based sort of programming. And on Thursday, we will be conducting a How to Conduct Oral Histories program from about, about noontime, you can bring your lunch. And I will share out a link to that also with the post event resource email. Uh, next week, or excuse me, next month, we will be uh, cross promoting, collaborating, Insights and In-Person Borderlands and a whole horse culture of Colorado initiative. We will be connecting with Chato or Mexican American cowboy culture. And that will be taking place October 22nd from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And it will, it's just gonna be all things uh, Chato kicking off to this program and should just be a blast. So I wanna begin by uh, introducing uh, Mona Lucero. Let me find my notes here. Um, since we, this lecture series seeks to connect community audiences with History Colorado's dynamic collection of artifacts, archives, and photography, and so much more, connecting them with community makers, history makers. That is in full demonstration today with Mona Lucero. She was born in San Francisco and raised in Grand Junction, Colorado. Mona graduated from the University of Colorado with a BFA. Having discovered her love of fashion during her senior year, she sprang from college into becoming an associate in fashion design at the Fashion Institute of New York City, where she worked in a variety of fashion industry jobs, including assistant pattern maker, screen print artist, technical designer, costume and active wear designer. In 1993, in her constant search to bring together art and fashion, Mona designed and created her first hand dyed and silk screened printed collection and began to wholesale her bags and clothing to fashionable shops. From 2002 to 2012, she sold her designs and other uh, Denver and international designers in her namesake boutique in Denver's Lower Highlands neighborhood. Mona is involved in community and is the head and co-originator of Fashion Association of Denver. She serves on the Blue Ribbon Commission of Denver's Arts and Venues Imagine 2020 Arts Initiative and is an advisor to Denver Architectural Foundation. She now runs a boutique located at 126 West 12th Avenue in Denver. And you can also find her online at monalucero.com. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tamar. 
Okay, well, I appreciate everyone coming in. I'm actually here at my shop today. And uh, so I just want to give you a little background on how this all happened, <clears throat> how this came about. Melissa DeBee and I, who is with History Colorado, and you'll meet her in, her in a few minutes, uh, we started talking about the possibility of introducing some of the textiles and interesting garments that are in the History Colorado collection. And I actually worked with Melissa once before during the 1968 exhibit. I did a, a talk on 1960s fashion. And so she came back to me and she said, do you have any ideas of what you might want to do? We'd love to have you back. And we went back and forth. There's so many different ways we could have gone, but we ended up choosing the topic of the clothes that we live in. And how that came about was one day on Facebook, I posted something to my followers and I said, hey, um, do you have anything that's in your collection that you've worn so much that it's actually kind of falling apart? And I had so many people, um, they seemed to really relate to that question. I had a lot of people telling me some amazing stories. And so I went back to Melissa and I said, what do you think about this? And she said, I think that would be a great idea. And so that's how we, how we started. So I want to introduce you to Melissa here. So first thing I wanted to say is, this is a quote from Mark Jacobs, who's a very well-known fashion designer. <clears throat> and he says, clothes mean nothing until someone lives in them. And anyone who's ever shopped for vintage can probably relate to this. Uh, clothing that's been worn just has a certain character to them. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Melissa DeBee. She is the Director of Collections Access and Senior Registration. Two of us, we're going to be talking about a um, little bit about fashion, but a lot about the, the collections that are the, the textile collection in specific uh, garments in the collection. And she's an expert, so I'm excited about that. And then at the end of this presentation, we will share a few different stories of people I know who were, happy, um, were excited and, and I feel very privileged that they shared some of their pieces with us. Melissa, um, how are you doing? Can you tell us a little bit about what you, uh, about yourself and, and the collection itself? Yes, uh, Melissa DeBee. I've been at History Colorado for uh, over 11 years now and it's always exciting. Working with the collections is is never boring. Um, Mona and I, when we started talking about a program that was five years ago, which seems like a very long time, uh, but it, we always have the most interesting conversations uh, because talking about fashion and clothing is always personal. It's always about uh, stories. People wear clothing every day. You use you use clothes every day, and that's why it's there's always these connections to make. Um, at History Colorado, our role is to preserve history and and make connections. And a primary way we do that is through uh, collecting, preservation, and um, making everything accessible. We we don't just collect stuff; we collect stories. Uh, uh, something has no meaning unless uh, it's associated with uh, a person, a place, a thing. It has a story to tell. It has an interesting tidbit uh, about it that makes it special. Um, everything has a story and our job is to preserve not only items, uh, not only the items physically, but also the stories and the information that go with it. And that's what we do to, to make it accessible. That's why we operate the research center. That's why we do exhibits uh, and loans and make things uh, available so people can discover them. Uh, we tease out those stories and we make those connections so that history becomes personal and it matters to people and we can connect with it. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm super happy that Mona came back and could do the program for us because uh, you get the little tidbit of what it's like to talk um, and discover all these stories and go back and forth and figure out some of these connections and what makes things like clothing so interesting. Um, so we're going to share some of those stories and highlight some of those connections. Uh, with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Mona, and you can get started. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, so I... <laughs> 
I put together a few ideas of what I thought, you know, why do people um, hang on to these things? And these were a few basics. I'm sure there are other reasons why people hold on to things, but these were, we're going to go over these individual ideas. First of all, the garment can feel good. It looks good on you. It reminds us sometimes of something or someone It brings back memories. Sometimes people think a garment brings them luck. The garment can, we actually can identify ourselves through the garment and ultimately a garment can capture our imagination. We talk about clothing, but it can also be an accessories and a variety of other things that we wear. Why do we love certain clothes so much? I kind of, I wanted to show this just as an example that even celebrities can wear things a few times and it's, it makes news when they do because usually they just wear one thing once and then they get rid of it because they don't want to be seen photographed in it twice. But as you can see here, Helen Mirren is wearing the same dress four times. Hel Helena Bonham Carter is wearing hers three times. And even the editor in chief of Vogue magazine, Anna Winter is wearing a dress twice. That's, that says something. There's something about those pieces that they love. So one of the things that- Mona, can I interrupt? Are you sharing your screen? I am. Oh, you can't see it? No, we can't see it. Sorry about that. Hold on a second. Because I love those celebrity pictures. So I want to make sure people can see them. Okay. Thanks for, let's see. Can you see it now? Yes, that's it. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Sorry, you guys. So these um, on the left is Helen Mirren wearing the same dress four times. Helena ben Bonham Carter is in the middle and she's wearing this dress three times. And on the right, this is Anna Winter. She's so famous for being, you know, many people think of her as a fashion snob and she actually wore a dress twice. I just thought that was really interesting. And obviously there's something about these pieces that they love. So they're no different from any of the rest of us. One of the things that we talked about originally was the story behind a worn piece. So these pieces, this is actually stuff that you can actually find in a store. They are actually torn and worn and they have been processed by the manufacturer to look like they've been worn. So there obviously is something about worn clothing that we all find fascinating. I think part of it is they feel really good on, the fabric gets softer, the fabric takes on a certain character and there's just something that people want. And so uh, I'm not sure why, but there's just something about a worn piece of clothing that people are attracted to. So Melissa pulled a few pieces that speak to this idea. And uh, Ms. Melissa, what do you, I remember you telling me a little bit about these suspenders. Yeah, we've gone back and forth and talked about some of these. And I, some of the pieces that we pulled to talk about, like this one, are just uh, popped out, not only because they, they go with a, uh, um, a collection. So this pair of suspenders is with an outfit that came from someone that worked on a farm. Uh, it wasn't anybody super important, but clearly it shows uh, signs of repair that they, they wore the suspenders, they either snapped or broke and they had to fix them and they kept wearing, wearing them. Um, just to, to see like, to, and take guesses of what you think the, the story is. Uh, and we have that information to highlight. And I find that kind of detail fascinating when you're looking at collections. Really cool too. What about this one? There's a fireman's belt. Yes, this same thing. It's extremely worn. There's a lot of repairs on it. This one uh, is obviously a, a a work belt has somebody's name on it. It um, comes from Fire Hose Company 2 up in Leadville, actually. And we um, know that it came from somebody, obviously their name was Humphreys because you don't put somebody else's name on your clothes or your belt. Mm -hmm. um, but it, so not only for, for personal purposes, but we also see this kind of uh, wear and tear and uh, repairs and love with um, work items as well. How do you, um, just a quick question, how is it, how do you decide what is going to be kept in your collection? I think for, for us, we want to acquire items that do come with a story. 
we don't want a generic toaster. The toaster is always a good example. And I could use a pair of shoes as an example too for clothing. We don't want any, any pair of um, shoes. We don't want just any wedding dress because we have a million of them. We want the wedding dresses that, that tell a story, that have that personal connection that people can relate to and engage with. Um, so we acquire things that either come from uh, significant places that tell stories, people, businesses, time periods, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. Um, I love this one. Jeans in particular, we both felt were important because so many people wear their jeans down. Can you tell us a little bit about these? Yeah, I think we've had a lot of great conversations about jeans, personal and work-related. Um, these ones, I wish that there were splashes of paint to help go with the story, but um, these belong to Robert Lanou, um, who was a, a very famous West Western artist that lived in Denver. Uh, so we know that he, he wore these personally or maybe wore these when he was working, uh, but we know that they came from him and that he wore them. But from that, we're also able to draw connections to uh, other stories and other pieces in the collection. And this painting is actually one of, it's a very famous painting in our collection. Uh, referring to the Sand Creek Massacre, actually. Um, but he painted this. And when we talk about re relating to collections and the stories they tell, you can just imagine, you know, maybe he was wearing these jeans when he painted this. Maybe he took a trip to, um, throughout the state to try to uh, find other uh, topics for his paintings. We don't know, but that's that's the joy of using these collections to uh, to draw out and tease out those those personal connections and stories. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. Um, I looked up because I had not heard of him, and I just, actually today just looked him up because you had post you had um, I read your story about this, and there's a photo of him out in the wild, you know, outdoors painting. It's amazing. It's just there's a, I think a couple of them on. The, their website, robertlinno.com, I believe. And I was like, wow, this is super interesting. Sometimes one thing leads to another. And before you know it, you're, you're looking at some, you know, like you were saying, I mean, imagine this as part of a program for History Colorado. I think it'd be so fascinating. Yeah. And I think, I think not only some things are very outright and, you know, splashes of paint would, of course, make the connection even easier to see for people. But sometimes the allure of the collection is that it's not uh, obvious that this, this ordinary looking pair of jeans has this incredible story behind it. And you would never know unless you had the information that went with the jeans. Wow. That's awesome. I love this one. And these boots, uh, I found the boots just on your site, and I didn't know that they were owned by Governor Love. These are so beautiful. Excuse I, me, Governor, Governor yeah, Love. Yeah, I think this is a, it's a really funny story, because I can imagine this for him as well. So uh, we have a very large collection from Governor Lamb, uh, and we all know that the governors make trips throughout the states, uh, or throughout the state, uh, and or people gift them items. So it's unclear whether or not he wore these boots and he's on the left in the photo at a groundbreaking ceremony actually for our old building that was at 12, uh, thir uh, 1300 Broadway. Um, but he, there's information in the record that says that there are signs of uh, manure on the boots still so I can just picture him at maybe a, a ribbon ceremony for maybe a centennial farm, or he's out talking to ranchers about business, um, which I think is a great story that really makes that personal connection for someone even like the governor. Everyday yeah, people. It's really uh, the other one of the reasons that we hold on to things is that we uh, we remember things, the memories, what we what we wear is associated with the memory. And this one, Melissa found, and when she explained how many times it had been repaired, I thought it must have meant something to this person. It, to me, it looks like it's a garment that probably costs some money, 
It doesn't look like it would just be by, uh, something that somebody would wear who didn't have any money. And so if they did own that and they kept repairing it, they could certainly have afforded to buy something else. So there was, must have been something really important about this dress to them, I would think. I agree. I think, I think making those, uh, those, assumpt- those guesses too, I think is a really neat part of figuring out what the collections are about and what they mean. Because I, we have another piece that will show that's like that too. They, if they can afford something like this, then obviously they could replace it. But just picture this might have been a, show, a showcase piece. Maybe it was their favorite and they wore it to parties. Um, it, it could be anything, but the piece is fascinating because of the beading and the sequins and the detail work. So it's easy to see how it could be a favorite for somebody. Um, and the, the family is actually related to early, um, pi- early settler pioneer families from the late 1800s mm-hmm. uh, here and in Colorado Springs. Oh, wow. But it's just fascinating to guess some of those backstories. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that this was probably all hand beaded too. Uh, Likely. Now, yeah, now you can, many things can be manufactured more easily than, but back then, I'm sure this was all hand beaded. There's a lot of work that goes into this. And it also, piece. the condition, I mean, there are some pieces that um, are in poor, con- uh, not very poor, but missing beads and sequins. But even for over a hundred years later, it's still in remarkably good condition. And that also tells you something too, that they took care of it and they cared about it. Oh, wow. I love this one because it it kind of makes me, I don't know why, but for some reason I feel a little bit, like I kind of laugh a little bit for this one because it looks like it's kind of playful. And to me, it seems like it's obvious that the person went different places and everywhere they went, they put a new pin on their hat. Um, yeah, I actually had to look this up this morning, uh, the word Alpini, because this was in the catalog information, but Alpini were, uh, Italian mountain infantry. Um, so I haven't looked more closely at this and I'm going to have to now because I think that there are connections to the 10th mountain, um, division, which is interesting in and of itself because we have a lot of items like this, but, there, you know, whoever Soapy Antonelli was, and if there were connections to the military or 10th Mountain, uh, who knows? But, uh, you know, decorating items and clothings and ex- clothing and accessories was obvious too. You know, you think about the pins that you buy when you take vacations and ha- when you travel. That's obviously what happened with this hat too. Mm-hmm. I love stuff like that. I'm always putting patches on my clothes, just adding and playing with that idea. Just, it, I think they're fun. It adds color and, and it also, people always kind of want to know, you know, they come to you and ask you what it is, what do you have on there? So I'm sure Soapy probably got a lot of, um, <laughs> probably a lot of talk about his hat when he wore it. Yeah. <laughs> I love this one. So this one was owned by a madam in Salida. Yeah, we, uh, a, a very well-known madam, Laura Evans, um, but this, this makes me think of the other dress as well, because it's uh, an outward appearance. It's in really good condition. There's some staining and some soiling, but overall it's in really good condition. But when I looked inside, there are alterations made uh, to the piece um, that they've, you know, changed some of the hems and, and, um, uh, made it s- smaller, probably, uh, and I it it makes me think the same thing that Laura Evans, i she because she was well known, she had money, she could have bought new dresses, but when you alter something, or you modify it in ways, it it does make you think that this has to have it had to have been a favorite because why spend the money to, or the time to alter something when you could just buy new. Mm-hmm. Altering, I, you know, I do alterations on my own clothes, um, my own designs, and sometimes altering something is actually harder than making it from scratch. It can be pretty intense. And this is a fairly complicated garment too, so to try to alter, alter it is not the easiest thing. But I also see it looks like there might be a zipper down the middle too, so that also means some major changes. I'm sure there wasn't a zipper originally. 
um, since it's 1945. I don't think people were, I actually don't even know if zippers were even quite in existence yet. They might have been, but they definitely weren't used in the center front like that. She, um, so yeah. It's Agreed. She added shoulder pla pads too, and I don't think that those were original. Oh yeah, those shoulder pads look a, a little newer. These are really interesting. They definitely have a lot of wear and tear. These connect to one of our core exhibits as well, the, um, the Kyoto exhibit, um, the Destination Colorado. They are 1930s shoes that came in with, I'll use air quotes for the, the Kyoto collection. Um, it's a large collection from the Plains that came in from a few significant families in a community that was founded by the, the railroad, but where um, that was small enough where everybody knew everybody. And the general store was also, the post office was also uh, where you bought your groceries and you did your business and you did your banking, et cetera. And I find it fascinating that, that people, um, you know, we talk about modifying and altering clothes uh, because you love them, but there's also the idea that uh, people had heart, you know, we've gone through depressions and other hard times and people did that because sometimes they had to because there was, resources were scarce and money and time were scarce. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously yeah, that's what happened with these shoes. That's true. But it's interesting, like, why didn't they throw them out after it was all said and done? So there must have been some connection to them later, too, you know? Right. So I threw this in, although we don't, I, didn't, I don't believe there's anything that we found in the collection that has to do with luck. But I started thinking about another reason why people hold on to their clothes. And that can be associated, like, it's my lucky hat or my lucky, you know, this or that. And although we don't know that this was anyone's lucky hat, I thought this hat had so much character to it, and I could imagine when you read this story that this person may have worn it for decades, and, you know, in a certain way that could be considered a lucky hat. Melissa, what do you, um, I see that it, it started out with, the guy was a trader and then eventually became an artist? Uh, yeah, uh, I, and was also a soldier, so the idea of luck and identity, which I know you're going to be talking about soon, uh, really comes into play and could be, it could be very feasible, especially someone that uh, was in the Civil War, um, a, a trapper trader, became artist. We have a large collection from John Dare Howland and, uh, as, as an artist, but also as a collector, um, just because of the relationships and significance that he as a person had. Um, and you know, what this hat meant to him, we can only, you know, we have limited information, but we can draw conclusions from what that information is and how it relates to other items. That's cool. I love this one. Um, so then we, I wanted to talk about the clothes that we identify with. And um, those can be work clothes. They can be associated with clubs that we're involved with. Um, it can be a variety of things that we identify with. And I thought this one was interesting, especially since we so much is, is happening around uh, protests. And this is something from the 1970s um, from here in Colorado. Can you tell us a little bit about this, Melissa? I think, um, and also to point out too that um, Mona and I, when we talked about some of these collections, the idea of pieces as identity and having that, that, Per, that connection uh, was incredible. And this, I think, is a, a perfect illustration of what that means um, uh, to show, you know, identity, uh, an Aslan shirt related to Chicano movement um, from the late 60s, early 70s, uh, just to show who you were, how you self-identified, um, to show and participate in community and it, 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 the idea that items like clothing and other collections can do that and still hold that story and tell that story uh, after the fact is incredible. Because you, you if you see people um, 
you, and if you wear, if you wear a shirt or a piece of clothing like this, it creates that same um, identity, like you just said, which draws to community. And it, 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 I, I have tingles thinking about it because it draws up all of these connections that are exactly what we try to do with the collection. And one simple piece like this can tell all of those different stories and make all of those relatable to people in different ways. So I thought it was a great pick. Good. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> this one was one of your picks, which I also like a lot. Um, patch jeans. People are still doing a lot of that right now. I think a lot of this is coming back and it's actually a very sustainable practice too. You know, you're not throwing away your old stuff and you're, you know, repurposing or making it more interesting as it wears. I, Mona, can you, you had a really good comment about this and this idea of community as well as, as far as patch jeans and jean jackets and things like that too. I think that that is a really good um, uh, I don't remember. What it, I don't remember what I said exactly, but I think it was the idea that the it's more more than likely that these jeans were not damaged. That the the patches are just aesthetic, so that they can that idea of identity, so that you can someone can have a look and be be part of a group um, mm -hmm. and part of a community and a space. Yeah, and I mean, because they're from San Francisco, was a big right. thing too. Makes you think that they might be hippie, like hippie-ish pants or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be a variety of things. Um, right now, there are so many makers, people who are um, call themselves makers, who are doing, they're taking designs and redoing them. And uh, um, upstyle is a current word that people have been using for a little while. Um, and they do take on the character of that person. And, and they are very, you know, it's like you are part of other people who are similar, doing similar things, but it's also your own individual look you know it does say something about you as an individual um, I love this one because uh, it's a uniform and obviously well, again why didn't this person throw this away I've, there must have been a connection even after they left the job it meant something to them it reminded them of where they worked maybe hopefully good memories um, but I love this one it just has so much character and just thinking about the type of work they might have done and, uh, you know, what you can um, see just by, by looking at the clothes, what you can guess about the background and the story. Right. It also looks like a pretty small garment to me. Um, you know, people are getting bigger all the time, but it looks small. It's even possible it could have been a woman or, but whoever it was, they, they're not, a, they weren't a big person. Tell us about this one. I thought this one was amazing. This is a beautiful piece. I like this pick from you as well. Um, we, all, we both have our good favorite picks. Uh, yeah. there's, so this is Kit Carson. We have the coat in the collection as well as the photo in the collection. And there's much to say about Kit Carson. Um, but the part of the story that I like, uh, and the two coats are very similar. One is actually on exhibit in uh, Trinidad. Uh, right now, um, but we have actually done a, a lot of research, and we we are pretty confident that we have found the place where we think these coats were made, which is down in Las Vegas, New Mexico, close mm -hmm. to Trinidad, uh, at the Frontier Costuming Company, and even have a name of um, the maker, which is pretty significant for a coat that is 150 plus years old. Um, but just the you know, the, the idea of this being identity and uh, the, you know, a Western look and, um, you know, that this person was a, a trapper or, or uh, some, somebody uh, in the Western story and seeing Kit Carson wearing it uh, was a really cool story and a connection to make. That is so interesting. Would love to know about more. I'm going to look into that, the Frontier Costuming Company. It's so cool. Um, I love this one, and I'll just say briefly, uh, when we talk about memories and association with clothing, this, you know, is a crazy, it's made from a crazy quilt. And if you think about every piece, there's, I don't know how many pieces of fabric are on here, 
um, but it, they came from different garments or different, maybe just fragments of fabric that were left over from other things. Who knows where it all came from? But each one of those pieces in that fabric is uh, an idea or a thousand ideas just to make that one piece of fabric and how it ended up on this coat. Um, you know, people held on to these things and then made this beautiful garment. And then on top of that, once the garment was made, they kept wearing it. So it's really a fascinating piece. And showing to the story of the grandmother making it for um, the donor's grandmother making it for her and her cousin is fascinating. The idea of, you know, recycling and reusing, which is not new, um, but, you know, using the materials to over and over because that's what you do. It's, it's a great piece. It is. I would love to see somebody um, in it. And at, I see here it says the donor wore the coat as a college student with pants. I would wish I could see a photo of that. I, bet, <laughs> I looked. I bet that's and I so didn't find cool. <laughs> I love that one. Um, and then I wanted to end with the. Samples here. The first one was by my friend Carrie Knowlton, and she. This is actually from a blog of hers. And uh, I, are you guys able to hear me? It says my internet's a little slow, but you're okay. We can hear you now. It's good. Okay. So this was by a, Carrie, a blog from my friend Carrie Knowlton, and she said she bought these pants. They're they should, she finally threw them away, but she bought them like, quite a while ago, and. Um, she was in Paris and bought them from someone on the street and didn't try them on. And they turned out to fit her so great. She always felt like she looked so good. And she'd wear them every New Year's Eve for years until finally, I guess she wore them so much, she wore them out. And one of her friends said, you know, it might be time for you to let them go. <laughs> but she loved them. And so this is her story about it. Um, these are, this is a t-shirt from one of my friends who she said she bought it, um, bought this t-shirt in Japan, in Japan, and it's so worn that she does, she's afraid to wear it anymore because she thinks it's just going to, you know, fall completely apart. But she just loves this. Um, she doesn't know what it says, but she loves the drawings on the right of the Kiss characters. And then this one, I think, is one of the most touching ones that was sent to me. This woman, um, so the woman on the left is her mother, and the woman on the right is her. And um, her, they lived in, the, they were in the Peace Corps in Africa, and her mother used to wear this t-shirt. And so 40 years later, she still wears that t-shirt, but it's now getting to the point where it's about to fall apart. So she commissioned a needlepoint of the design for, as a Mother's Day gift for her mom. I just thought that was just so touching, such a beautiful story. And I appreciate her sharing that with us. And then finally, I added this, the clothes that capture our imagination. Probably all of us have something where it's like, oh, it makes us feel, you know, when I wear that, I feel beautiful, or I feel like a starlet, or I feel, you know, like a cowboy or something. There's all kinds of reasons why we wear what we wear. And um, so this is me, and I'm wearing brooches that say Shirley on it. Um, there used to be a department store here in Denver, and actually I think they were around on the Western states. It was called Fashion Bar. And Fashion Bar always had the coolest clothes. As I was growing up, I always wanted something from Fashion Bar. I have a friend who likes to dumpster dive, and he brought me a package one day. And in that package were things like thread and scissors and needles and things like that, most of which I didn't need. But I found in this package, there was also all of these brooches that, said, that were from Fashion Bar with the name Shirley on it. So from re looking at this package, I thought, Shirley must have worked at Fashion Bar. She must have been a sewer or a designer. She was definitely interested in fashion. And of all the things that were in the package, this is my pros one of my most prized possessions. So every time I put this jacket on, I think of Shirley and I wonder, where is Shirley now? And I want, end, I want to end with this quote. Trust not the heart of that man for whom old clothes are not venerable. Thank you all for being here. And we'd love to take some of your questions.
And it looks like we don't have any questions from the chat. I know Tamara's keeping an eye on that too. Um, perhaps opening up a discussion with uh, if anybody has a favorite piece of clothing that you love to death or you can't part with. Anybody like to share or even show? And what folks can do for this one is you can open up your videos and if you have a piece prepped, you can share that way. Um, you should be able to control uh, your video that way too. Be right back. <laughs> I can get started while Juan uh, grabs his. Here, let me turn my, my virtual background off. That'll help. Um, great. So speaking of like old t-shirts that you're scared to wear because you think they're gonna fall apart, I picked up this t-shirt in Kathmandu in 1999. Oh. And um, I cut it into this really weird um, tank top and I made it too deep for my liking so I put sewing pins there not as like a punk look but just as a modesty gesture and um, right before I moved to Vancouver British Columbia in 2007 I ran the boulder boulder in this t-shirt and I was very proud of that so yeah, that's so cool I love this shirt I can't believe it's still around it's night awesome. and see that indicates so get, let's say if we were to find that and somehow it was in the history Colorado collection we'd be like why are those safety pins on the side? <laughs> We'd have right? all kinds like, of things. <laughs> is it style? Is it form or is it function? And that's what made me think of the, the San Francisco jeans too. So, right. Thanks We'd for letting me warm up. I love it. We'd have to catalog and all, this, all the holes and create stories for all the holes. And <laughs> That's pretty funny. I think Juan was going to go next. Did you have something, Juan? Yeah. Uh, I got this shirt, I don't know if you can see it. It's from New York City at Baruch College where I used to work and it was this club called Pride. And it's a Puerto Rican club. I don't know if you can see the writing there. It's a Puerto Rican club. And I got this in 1972. And I don't let go of this. It doesn't fit me anymore, but I just love this. And uh, I just keep it there in the closet. You know, so sometimes some clothes are sentimental, you know, and you have certain feelings. And this reminds me of that club and my participation in it. Wow, I love it. I like that black and white too. Black and white always looks good in a t-shirt. I'm curious um, about the people who have joined us. Like, what is it that if I don't, I know again, it might be a little nerve wracking to talk to us, but you know, you could put it in the chat. Like what in particular interested you about this, this talk? Is there something that you have owned your, or that, you know, what, what could it be? I'm just curious. Oh, yay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. So this is a shirt that I bought for $10. Before my husband and I moved to Denver, we took a tour around the Eastern US and we went to this um, Truro in Cape Cod and they were trying to save the lighthouse because it was falling into the ocean. So they were trying to raise enough money to move it back. So I think I bought this in 1993 and I've just kept it all that time because it was kind of cool. <laughs> wow. What do you like about it? The color or what is it in particular that you like about that? I mean, I think buying it, I like the color, but I think it was just that it was a cool thing that they were trying to, you know, save the lighthouse from falling into the ocean, so that's why I bought it, but that's probably why I've kept it all this time. <laughs> that is super cool. So I think Go ahead, Mona. I was going to say, you know, it, it's sometimes it's hard to, to know for sure why it is that you like that particular piece, but you love it. You just love it, you know? Yep. <laughs> Well, there's also the idea that, um, which is a good one too, that you're participating in something, that it's, it's a, it reminds you of, you know, helping a cause and being part of something bigger too, which goes to identity right. and memories and go ahead, Corey. Yeah, we see you, Corey. Uh, this shirt is a, it's a sixth grade camp shirt. 
that was given to everybody that was in our grade, and it has everybody's name listed on the back. Oh, that is so cool. Um, and the, the drawings and the, and the text were done by students in my grade. Oh, and that's awesome. This has been a sleep shirt of mine for 17 years. Wow. <laughs> I, I think the color is hideous, but what's amazing to me is it, it's so comfortable and the fact that it's held up so well. It, I mean, the, the actual screen print looks brand new. Like there, there's no errors even in the text in the back too. And I, I just think it's amazing, no holes. It's, it's pretty thin, but it's, it's still my favorite sleep shirt. <laughs> that is beautiful. I love that shirt. That, the drawing on the front is really, really cool. And then that everybody's names are in the back, that's really cool too keep wearing it. Or, you know, you can always get another, you know, have it remade in some way, you know, hang on to it in some way as it gets so old. Yeah. Hi, Charles. Good I don't night. think we can hear you. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Let's see if we can, can we unmute Charles? Charles, I think you're muted. Lenore. Oh, we can hear you now, I think. Can you want There you go. Great. Bad Zoom behavior. Anyway, speaking of Governor Lamb, this actually is a hat that he gave me, and it may have a tie to the boots in that uh, the boots are rather exotic, and I think the word hideous has been used before, <laughs> but I think we'd understand why he probably gave away the hat rather than wear it. <laughs> it's, it's got a lot of character, though. It's interesting. Is. Have you ever worn it? Uh, I've never worn it. It doesn't fit me, but I, I have a, somewhere I have a picture, I believe, of him wearing this hat. And do you hold on to it because you, it reminds you of him and, and that he gave it to you, or why do you hold on yeah. to it? Yeah, I've, I've known both uh, Governor Lamb and his brother for many, many years, uh, and uh, I actually did the Yampa Green River with Governor Lamb. Uh, the anecdotal story as we got into the boat, he said, okay, Charles, let's talk about how to solve health care. And I said, <laughs> well, I think I'm getting in a different boat, Governor, because I'm, I'm here to relax and enjoy the canyons. <laughs> there you That's go. a great story. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Do we have somebody else, too? Uh, let's see. I'm looking at. I love all these stories. It's yes. great. Uh, so Jennifer asked, I'm interested in how History Colorado decides which pieces of clothing to accept. This is different than when, why individuals relate to specifically owned cl articles of clothing. Oh, that's a good question. And I, I, I started to touch on that a little bit, but I can talk a little bit more detail. Um, I think the idea of individuals relating to their pieces is part of what makes it significant. And that story and that connection is usually what helps make the case for adding it to the collection. Um, you, you know, just like anybody else, we have limited space, we have limited resources, we can't take everything. Um, so we, we just don't have the space, we don't have the capacity to be able to do that. And uh, take care of things like we like we should. So we we try to limit uh, what we take, and we're really um, trying to hone in on those items that do have those connections and those stories, um, because that's part of what we're trying to preserve to to tell history of the state and beyond. Um, so I don't think it's different from why and how individuals relate, because uh, you know. Those stories that go along with the pieces are, are part of what makes it personal and they relate to um, time or a space or a place or a person or a family or a business. Uh, so it's really about keeping that information with the piece that makes it attractive to us to be able to add to the collection. Mm -hmm. I remember you saying though, like for instance, you were saying 
certain wedding dresses, like from the early 1900s, you said you couldn't take any more of them unless there was something really unusual because you already have a fair amount. Is that, was, did I remember that right? Yeah, and it, it's, it's true for a lot of different types. Wedding dresses is a big one. Um, I think Bethany's on, the, on the, the call and she takes in a lot of our acquisition requests, so she can probably uh, say the same thing, but we get a lot of requests uh, for pianos too. And there's only so much space we have for pianos. Um, and it's hard, to, it's hard to tell people that. But I think, you know, what we're trying to do is to, to fill the gaps. I know right now we're trying to focus on contemporary materials after World War II because we're lacking those stories. We're trying to tell stories that we don't necessarily have that are missing in the collection. So different community groups. Um, gender, ethnicities, age, uh, just so that it's not the same story that we're telling over and over. So it's all about, you know, figuring out where some of those, those interesting um, stories are to fill gaps. Um, mm -hmm. Different areas of the state are also something we want too, so that it's not all pinpointed in certain locations. Right. Um, I see that, um, I just wanted to read a couple of things here. So I see that um, Lori says, it's amazing how sad you feel when you get rid of an article of clothing and then lament that years later. I've had that happen. And I've actually had things like I've left something by accident somewhere and I still, every once in a while I remember, I'm like, oh, that one sweater that I love so much, it's gone forever. So I understand that one. And then somebody says, I do not have a personal antidote, but wanted to mention an off the wall example. Lady Gaga's infamous meat dress from the VMAs. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame preserved it for 10 years until it became jerky. Not an ideal fabric for preservation. <laughs> no, it's you know, not ideal. <laughs> yeah. um, and I know that Corey has, a, has worked at the uh, Rock and Roll um, Hall of Fame Museum. And if she wanted to share just a little bit about, I mean, talk about contemporary collecting and, and items with stories if we wanted to go there in the remaining time we had. And I said four-ish, this is a conversation we can, we can keep going on with as well. Yeah, I, um, I did work at the museum at one point when we had the meat dress and it was <laughs> is very interesting piece to, to put on exhibit. Um, I did post a picture if, if nobody has seen it um, or a, a link to a picture. Um, and it was it was actually conserved by a pretty well known um, conservation agency in Ohio called the ICA, and um, it was it, it's a very difficult process because it was I mean it was raw meat she was wearing raw meat so um, and she actually she asked us she actually wanted it to be placed in the museum raw and have it decay sort of like an art piece and we're like well uh, we cannot do that <laughs> um, and she's like what if you put like a ventilation system in and it's like okay no we cannot do that um, so we had to go with this um, preservation technique and like somebody said in the comment it, it pretty much turned into jerky like a brownish jerky so the ICA had to go in and paint it um, wow. to make it look a bit more like raw meat. Um, Lady Gaga's dress is an extreme example of some of the issues that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has to deal with with contemporary collecting and particularly working with artists because a lot of the stuff that um, artists, that's made for artists, like whether it's on the road, like if they're touring or if it's for a music video is not meant um, to be saved for long periods of time. Um, an example I always think of is we have these uh, Cindy Lauper shoes. They're, they have Cindy Lauper shoes at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that have um, that were used for an album cover, and it has a picture of Van Gogh's Starry Night on the bottom. But all it was was just like a clipped out piece of almost like magazine paper that was taped onto the bottom of the shoe. You know, not meant to last, just for a photo. So that's something. Um, that the Rock Hall has always been thinking about and has to really some um, like difficulties when preserving material like that from artists. Well costumes many times are they're made just for the effect but 
Um, you, I don't know if you got to see the Star Wars exhibit um, that was at the Art Museum a couple years ago. I don't remember, three or four years ago. Um, and that was fascinating because those costumes were made, I mean, they're like couture. They're beautifully, beautifully made. So you can tell how much money they have to put together a, a Star Wars movie. But it is interesting because some people, they just want to create the effect just for a couple of times. And then if people fall in love with it, it's like, oh no, how are we gonna keep this going for a while longer? Because it was never made well in the first place. Mona, having been a costume designer, did you err more on the side of couture or effect, would you say? Or maybe a little of both? Usually effect, because um, usually I work with a very small budget. But um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll take something that's already pre-existing and then make changes to it. And I do still have things that are, you know, I have things that, you know, I have a couple of storage spaces with old pieces that I've made. Um, some of them were wearable art pieces. Um, and so those wearable art pieces have just all kinds of stuff on them, um, found objects and things. And I always, and sometimes I go, you know, I know these are going to eventually just fade away. They can't last for very long. They're being pulled on by these heavy objects and, you know, they've been put away in an improper way for years. And, you know, I always say to people when you're trying to get like you feel like something's going to go away and you're, you can't hold on to it forever, inevitably um, pieces are going to disintegrate, then make sure you take photos. Um, the woman who did the, uh, an embroidery based on that t-shirt, that was really smart. And she has photos of it, which is super cool, of her mother and her mom and her wearing it. Um, that is just wonderful. And so a lot of times I tell people, if you're, you're really having trouble getting, letting go of something, Make sure you record it in some way so that at least you can revisit it in photos and, you know, maybe wear it one more time before you get rid of it and have somebody take some nice pictures and, and then you, you at least still can revisit that memory. Would anyone else like to share or ask a question before we wrap up today? Well, I want to acknowledge that um, I know someone asked about volunteering in the textile collection and I dropped a link to History Colorado's volunteer website. I'll also include that in the email, resource email I'll be sending out post event. I'm also going to capture some of these great other links, uh, particularly that Corey has shared. So this is one way that this program can live on. Um, we also have Mona's website for you to go to and just you know, just opening up the world of possibility and further exploration um, is one thing we really like to do for Insights and In-Person, continue the connection afterward. If you enjoyed the program and you want to continue supporting programs like these, as well as the invaluable programs at History Colorado, I've dropped our donation link into the chat as well. Um, and uh, if there's uh, no other questions. I know stories and conversation can go on forever. Uh, we can close up for now and I'll be happy to um, share that resource email and if anybody has any additional questions feel free to email us at our kind of our research desk email. I'll drop that in the chat as well and we can pass things on to Mona and I can put that in the email too if you are a little shy or just needed to think about things a little further. I really want to thank Mona and Melissa for being here and um, all of you for being here. This is our first opportunity to do a community gathering like this and it was so wonderful to do and um, I should not be the one to have the last word. I'll pass it off to Mona and Melissa and thank you so much everyone for being here and I'll let Mona and Melissa have the final word. <laughs> uh, Melissa, you want to say something? <laughs> Well, uh, thank you again, Mona, for doing this. This was so much fun. I love talking with you about this and basically having a conversation with people listening and watching us. Um, please visit Mona's site. I know you are still staying busy. Um, is your shop open? Have you told anybody hours? I, I am open. I'm open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday afternoons until about five or six o'clock, depending on how busy it is. You know, this is different times. So, um, that's when I'm open and you can always check me out. The other place you can find which is uh, more current in terms of seeing what I'm doing and I share a lot on social media, maybe a little too much sometimes, 
in terms of like, there's lots of photos, lots of things happening in terms of the events I'm involved with and other people who are in Denver. So you, if you go to Instagram, go to Mona Lucero official or to shop Mona Lucero and you can find a lot of interesting things there. Um, before I finish, I, I just wanted to um, encourage everyone to enjoy during this time. I know a lot of times people are, they're like staying home and you feel like nobody's seeing you, but enjoy, still enjoy clothing, enjoy um, expressing yourself through clothing. That's one thing I always want to remind people about is you can really have fun with clothes and don't feel like you're being judged. People want to see you having fun. Um, clothes are just a, another part of our quality of life. 